Welcome to another episode of the Zach Hiley Show. Today, I have the luxury of being with Alina Hatar Medina, who is a seventh year neurosurgery resident here at Jefferson. Alina was born in Amman, Jordan, and grew up in the Middle East, as well as Odessa, Ukraine, and Montreal, Canada. Her family immigrated to Ramsey, New Jersey, when she was just 13 years old, and she attended John Hopkins University, where she earned a dual degree in neuroscience and public health. She returned to New Jersey after college to attend NJMS at Rutgers University for medical school. Alina enjoys a variety of surgical cases she's exposed to and is planning on specializing on spine and skull bases, correct? Yeah, correct. During her spare time, she enjoys running with her husband, Jose, who's a family medicine resident at Jefferson, having movie nights with their dogs, Macy and Snoop, great names, and spending time with her close-knit family in New Jersey. Welcome, Alina. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for coming. So we always start with some statistics around whatever the specialty we're talking about. So I'm going to talk about some statistics around neurosurgery, and then you tell me how you feel about them. Okay. So entering resident characteristics, the step one score average of a USMD graduate is 248 compared to the 232 average. So 248 for neurosurgery compared to the 232 average. Step two score average was 251 for neurosurgery residents and 245 average for everyone else. AOA membership, so 33% of neurosurgery residents were part of the AOA versus the rest was 11.5%. In regards to DO students, 15 applied in 2020 and three matched to neurosurgery. In regards to IMG students in 2018, 35 applied and 10 matched. In 2020, the match percentage was 74.3%, and it takes around seven years of training usually for a neurosurgery training. Salary-wise, Attending, the average salary of a general physician is 339000 The average academic medicine associate or full professor median salary is 752000 For hours, the average physician works 51 hours a week, while the average neurosurgery attending works 58 hours a week. In regards to burnout, a 2020 burnout report says general burnout percentage was 48%. In neurosurgeons, it was 51.1%. In neurosurgeon residents, it was 45.4%, with the most important factor being personal accomplishment, according to the report. Anything interesting? Anything surprising? Or uh, I would say, so those are some... Um the statistics for kind of entry into yeah. neurosurgery can be uh, kind of scary to people, yeah. and I think um, there, scary are, to th- me. <laughs> yeah, there are ways of getting around this. Uh, even if you don't have the highest step one score, um, and we joke every year when we're kind of interviewing medical students that the bar it seems keeps getting set higher and higher because people are just, you know so accomplished and um and although that may be true i think if you're kind of uh your sights are set on neurosurgery uh there are ways of doing research and kind of rounding out your application to uh becoming somebody who who has a real chance of being able to do it uh and enter you know residency um some of the other statistics don't seem as uh uh, kind of surprising. I think neurosurgeons in terms of uh, burnout, I think uh, oftentimes you kind of feel a, uh, it's very rewarding to, to be mm-hmm. in this field. So uh, you kind of get a lot of, um, you know, like in some ways you're very inspired by your patients. And I think that helps with, with that. So the burnout part, uh, I guess I'm a little surprised that it's actually a little higher than... For attendings? That's yeah. So that was interesting to me, the 51% for neurosurgery attendings and 45% for the residents. Yeah. That's weird. I don't know. Yeah. You would expect that yeah. residents would be more burnt out because think, they, they spend so. more time in the hospital. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. But also, like, you have the resident camaraderie. We, like... Mm-hmm. Form basically a family because you end up spending so much time with other residents and uh, fellows in your program that you you have other people to rely on. Mm. Maybe when you're in attending, it's that part of it is higher. Cool. So let's get right into it. Okay. What is neurosurgery? Uh, neurosurgery uh, is a field where we basically get to operate on the brain and the spine, um, and it deals with a lot of um, neurologic. Uh, disorders, uh, 
uh, and structural disorders that can be treated with surgical techniques and tools. Um, so kind of in vascular, you have um, patients who have strokes, subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, you know, uh, brain hemorrhages, dealing with patients like that. Uh, you have patients who have experienced uh, degenerative spine disease or uh, have unfortunately had a spinal cord injury, for example, and treating those patients. Uh, there are different subspecialties of mm -hmm. neurosurgery, but those are just some examples of um, what what some of those can look like. And your interest, you said, is, is spine and skull base. Is that like, I'm trying to think. So I guess I, I don't know much about neurosurgery. So I guess... Skull base, as opposed to the rest of the skull, you're not working kind of at the front of the skull, the lateral aspects of the skull? Yeah, there's some overlap. Skull base deals with uh, ba literally the base of the skull yeah. where uh, a lot of important cranial nerves and, and uh, vascular structures live. Um, so uh, it's a, I guess, subfield in cranial neurosurgery. Um, and then I am doing an Infolded Spine Fellowship currently. An Infolded Spine Fellowship, what is that? So Infolded Fellowships in neurosurgery just means uh, mean that you're completing a f fellowship within your seven years. Mm. Um, in the past, there were some programs that were six years long and now every program is mandated to be basically seven years. Uh, and there have been some kind of talk about kind of making the residency I think kind of on a national scale of making residency for neurosurgery shorter or specializing at an earlier time. Uh, but basically, an enfolded fellowship allows you to do a fellowship within your residency. Um, that's usually done at your own institution. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, I did my uh, kind of neurosurgical years, one year of uh, research, as well as uh, last year I did my chief year. Uh, where you're kind of running, you know, an entire service and and kind of pulling the strings behind what it, what it takes to kind of care for neurosurgical patients um, and kind of lead your neurosurgical team. And then this year I get to do specialize in, a, you know, a specialty in neurosurgery and uh, I chose to do uh, spine. Uh, so I'm basically just doing spine surgery and seeing patients and that's great so what is, so pg so pgy6 is chief year pgy7 is kind of a specialty you get to do more kind of pick and choose what you're more interested in yeah uh i mean you you still kind of apply into it and yeah. uh but uh my two other co-residents co-fellows are doing a vascular i see uh fellowship currently. Uh, so they get to do endovascular training as well as open vascular. So you, we do have other um, kind of uh, uh, fellowships in the residency, but that's what... That's cool, fellowship within residency. That's yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. So, and then the first, you guys don't have to do a uh, like prelim year or anything, right? It's mm -mm. just straight into neurosurgery, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So can you talk me through the first... Five. So we know what sixth year is, chief year. Okay. Seventh year is you're kind of picking and choosing more of your fellowship. What are the first five years of neurosurgery yeah. residence like? So intern year, first, of course. I would say intern year was the most stressful okay. year of my entire training. Really? Only because you're given so much responsibility. Uh, patients can be very sick who you're taking care of. And you do have a lot of guidance, like you're not you're not alone. There's always oversight and you're kind of uh, buddied up with a second year resident mm -hmm. uh, most of the time. Uh, and when it comes to kind of like initially evaluating patients, triaging things. Um, but it's, I just remember, you know, in medical school, you're not taught that much about neurosurgery. Like you kind of have to make your own experiences happen and seek, you know, neurosurgical experiences, kind of do research on your own time. And then fourth year, you get to experience a little bit of it. But uh, oftentimes, like, med school is not really geared towards teaching you about neurosurgery specifically. Um, so, and off, and it's, I think we make it a little more intimidating than it is. 
like it becomes this black box of, uh, you know, this person has this, this issue. And, um, but in reality, it's, uh, you know, it's, I think you just have to have a strong work ethic and, um, you know, it's, it's possible for anybody interested in, in neurosurgery going to medical school to, to do that. Ultimately, mm-hmm. you just kind of have to decide how much, um, if you're willing to make some sacrifices to be able to do it. Um, so I think first year was very stressful in terms of kind of, uh, I felt like there was such a big change between going from my fourth year to mm-hmm. intern year. And, um, you, uh, you suddenly like are taking care of very, very sick patients and, um, it's, it's kind of more stressful. And then you, you realize by the end of the year, how much learning has happened, uh, because things just come second nature. And then you're put into the position of needing to teach the other incoming class. Oh, God. Right. So then the second year you're teaching away, right? Oh yeah. So then you're like, Oh wow. I, you know, they ask you questions and to you, like all of these things just you've internalized them because you've taken care of so many patients over the year. And then, um, like there is progress that, that is made, but oftentimes like in the moment of, you know, dealing with multiple emergencies at the same time in the ER, the trauma department can be pretty grueling when you're, when you're just an intern, but we do have a lot of help. Like our, our support staff is phenomenal. Our nurses are phenomenal. Or, you know, oftentimes, like when I was an intern in the OR or a junior resident, you know, I would learn so much from like our nurse practitioners or just nurses in the OR who would be like, oh, why don't you try this? Like, you know, you just have to kind of be open to getting some of that education in ways that you didn't think you would, you would get it. Um, so second year, you're kind of, uh, more, you're having more of that, uh, teaching opportunity with a more junior resident, first year resident. And then you get to start going to the OR more, I would say. Um, because the first year you're, you're kind of, you're more managing people on the floors. Exactly. After surgery, before surgery. Yeah. You're rarely actually, I In mean, maybe you are scrubbing room. into procedures and things like that. Yeah, I think... Like, uh, if you make, if you make your own, um, you can kind of figure out a way to go to the OR after hours. Like you spend the day. After your work day? Exactly. Like if there's an emergency and you really want to, you know, operate, you can, you can go and. So wait, wait, wait. So, 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 (laughs) so, so, so you sign, like sign out seven, right? Yeah. And then you stay till five. And then if. if, And then something comes in at 530. Yeah. And if it's a very exciting case, I've done it. I mean, I've also had, um, I've also had uh, senior residents just tell me like, oh, you'll, you'll get your opportunity like in the future. You should go home and get some rest (laughs) because that's also important. Like there should be somewhat of a work-life balance. But, um. You're just like so excited to be able mm-hmm. to do these things. Sometimes you you just want to be there, you know. Um, but you have some uh, opportunities in the OR as a first year. And especially now, actually, we've restructured um, our uh, program where because we have four residents, we have three residents, two residents doing kind of clinical rotations, mm-hmm. a third resident on neurology, or uh, kind of a, a um, another field of uh, that's very collaborative with mm-hmm. neurosurgery, learning, for example, radio- neuroradiology or neurology. And then the fourth resident does an operative rotation, so they get mm-hmm. to, to be in the OR, which I did some time in general surgery, which we no longer do, and that... That's interesting. Yeah. Interns, interns have rotations on their own. That's kind of nice, yeah, actually. Yeah. That's nice. So now it's different, but... Uh, I was the last class that did a general surgery rotation. And again, general surgery, we didn't really go. I think I went to the OR one day to mm-hmm. like a surgery center. Uh, otherwise, it was just a lot of floor floor work, seeing patients. Work. Yeah, that exactly. seems like the first kind of year. Yeah, you kind of have to learn MO. medicine and learn yeah. how to take care of people uh, perioperatively. So it's, that's a, get to do the fun stuff. Exactly. That's yeah. an important part. Um, 
So second year, you get to go to the OR, um, but you still have that role of like, you're the overseeing person teaching a junior resident and more responsibility falls on you um, in that in that sense. Like you need to know that everything is going to plan and, and hopefully mistakes are not being made and you're kind of, you run through things and like algorithms and protocols with the junior resident. Um, third and fourth year, you're doing more operative time too. Finally. Um, <laughs> and and uh, like in our third year, that's when we send residents to uh, CHOP for their pediatric rotation. Uh, and that's a rotation where kind of for the first time you're on a smaller team and you're immediately interacting with uh, the attendings. So you kind of become like your own junior and senior resident at the same time. Like you're doing floor work, but also you're running things Sounds by the like attending. Plus like you're going to the OR. It's, it's, uh, you do a lot of learning that way. Um, and you get like basically immediate feedback and they kind of tell you what they're thinking as well. So it's, it's pretty educational, but kids are very different than adults. So it's, that's also Is another there, thing and to you learn. Can, can you subspecialize in pediatrics afterwards? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Is that a fellowship? Can. Is that a residency? That's a, that's a fellowship. Yeah, that's a fellowship. It's a one-year fellowship. Um, and then fifth year, you kind of get to do uh, research on your own or do more clinical clinical work if, you, if you're interested. Um, and then sixth year is our chief year now. And then seventh year is kind of some more time. You get to do uh, either research, you get to do an enfolded fellowship, um, so you, you kind of get to decide. You get a, you get a good yeah. So you're kind of thrown into the fire, then you teach the people that get thrown into the fire, and then you start to get some OR time, and then you kind of get to do your research, and then you get to go do your chief year, so you're a big, big, big in charge person, yeah. and then you get to go do your specific interest once you're kind of nearing the end. That's interesting. Yeah. So you said the first year is the hardest, you think? I think so. You think I so? Thought, I thought chief year would be the hardest. Yeah. But, I mean... You're just trained to, uh, you spent all this time training to, Mm -hmm. you know, take good care of patients outside of the OR, patient uh, with patient selection, then you take them to the OR, you feel much more comfortable doing Mm -hmm. all the surgical procedures, you're given more autonomy and more responsibility, and then you take care of patients, you know, outside, out of surgery. Um, And you're like kind of in this innate, leadership position that you you kind of have to to you have to have some leadership skills mm-hmm. to be able to lead the team cohesively and um but at the same time you realize like we have some amazing support staff mm-hmm. and nurses and um and it's always nice you know at the end of of uh, a hospital stay that a patient had to hear that they had a great experience. They love the nursing staff. I don't think the food is great at the hospital otherwise. <laughs> um, but we'll cut that out. They'll, <laughs> they'll uh, um, you know, and then they'll tell you, oh, the junior, the junior residents were amazing and kind of hearing about uh, so many of the people who kind of make their care possible uh, is something that you know, I think makes makes us proud to be part of Jefferson. That's great. So how much are you working? How much? Give me a, so first year, when is the time you're working the most? Because I hear stories of, you know, people going into the hospital, nurse, or even my fourth year med student friends, they say they go in, they kind of sleep there a little bit because they don't want to miss procedures or don't want to be there like or miss the morning start early. How true is the thing? Because the neurosurgeon, I think, has the biggest stigma in 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 my learnings as a medical student okay. of being the the most work intensive specialty there is, right? This is the this is what I hear from other people, you know, other med students. Maybe not from real neurosurgeons or people that are actually in the field, but from other med students. How true is that? Are you actually working all uh, the time? Do you have no lives outside of? I don't. I think that part of neurosurgery is to some degree temporary. Yeah. And now that there are work restrictions, I mean, some people have mentioned that, you know, it's very hard to do all the required training within the limits of the work restrictions. But we still, you know, abide by those and 
kind of the 80 keep hours an a eye. Week. Yeah, I mean, we. I to be honest, I've never counted how many hours uh-huh. I spent in the hospital because I just. To me, I really enjoy my job, and I really enjoy being there. And especially if you love being in the OR, the way mm-hmm. time passes in the OR is just different than how it is outside of it. It's hard to explain, but some people ask me, you know, how long it takes to do a certain procedure, and they're baffled to hear that certain procedures take hours and hours. Or, oh. But it, I mean... You don't think of it that way because every surgery has different stages and different challenges. There are different things that you do with, um, I guess, you're you're like very dialed in to to certain parts of the procedure. You 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 maintain that throughout, um, but there are more you know intricate part to every procedure. There are parts where you're, for example, closing skin, and it's just kind of a routine thing that you've done. A lot. A lot of, I've thrown so many stitches, you know, over <laughs> over seven years that it's like, I don't even think about that part. Um, but you still have to kind of be meticulous and just make sure, you know, you're you're doing every, every part um, uh, well. Uh, but it's you kind of lose track of time when you're there. And I think, like, well, I guess I'm sure you'll ask me about my normal work day, but Mm -hmm. most of the time you would wait, you would be in the hospital kind of by 5 or so, 5 a.m. And then you, there's there's a lot to do and a lot to learn. And uh, we kind of make sure as when you're chief resident, for example, that, there's an efficient transfer of information that happens, whether that be in the morning when the night float person is signing out or in the, uh, you know, 5 p.m. when the day team is signing out and, you know, you, you need to make sure that everybody gets their rest too. Um, I think those, those hours, uh, the kind of long hours that you spend in the hospital – uh, I think that's kind of a temporary thing. And then once uh, once you're in fellowship or an attending, those things also change. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not forever. Um, and you kind of kind of makes you more, I think resilient and mm-hmm. able I'm to sure. do to do things even when you're a little tired. but uh, the work is exciting enough that like, you being tired doesn't doesn't affect you as much. Yeah. Then you go home and you eat something or you sit on the couch and you immediately, you know, fall asleep. Uh, because you don't have that, like, adrenaline that you have at work. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is an average? So, so you said 5 a.m. you would usually get there. Yeah, then- now, now I get there a little later. Um, but as chief, that's pretty much when you get to work, 5 a.m. Mm. You round on patients. Uh, you round with the night team, uh, and the night team is really just one resident <laughs> at each hospital. You so. round with the night team as well. It's not just not handoff. Yeah, you you round with them, and then you kind of uh, make sure that all the plans have been communicated got to it, the day got person. It, got it, got it. Um, so we're we're doing um, we're not doing like in person rounds with the with the residents, but oh, okay. as chief, you pretty much see. Um, like every ICU patient and then floor patients as well and new patients. Um, when you're, you know, in the morning, uh, you round, uh, you um, <clears throat> basically go make sure everything's ready for the patient, you know, whether they be elective or, or kind of pre-admitted. Uh, you make sure they're in the holding area, that everything is teed up and ready to go for, the, for surgery. Um, the OR starts at 7.15. That's when they get in the room usually. Uh, before that, uh, you kind of go over cases of final time with the attending uh, that you that w- you will be participating in. Um, and oftentimes we'll have like an educational conference a few times a week uh, prior to the OR starting. And then uh, you go to the OR, you do an average of like 
one to three cases a day. Uh, if it's three, it's usually like shorter cases. Uh -huh. If it's one, it's usually a longer, longer one. Um, and then for each case, you sign out to the nursing staff taking care of the patient uh, in the PACU or in the ICU, for example. Uh, and you sign out to your own team. Uh, and then at the end of the day, I would just go see all the patients that I've operated on that day and um, wait for the last patient to kind of be out of anesthesia and be able to do a neuro exam on them as well uh, before I go home. Um, so it's <laughs> every day is kind of, you, you don't Different. end up doing the same thing every yeah, day. On uh, average, is it like, so is it like five to? Uh, I would say like most days I, I would go home by six or seven. Okay. It's probably earlier now that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in fellowship, but also now in fellowship, I get to see patients in clinic, mm -hmm. which I've done a little bit of that during residency, but it ends up being that like the, there's so much to do in the hospital that we don't, uh, get as much experience in clinic. Uh, and now I get to see patients in clinic uh, for spine uh, who are either, uh, you know, referred by their primary care physician or by uh, pain management and come to see us. Uh, you counsel them about, you know, what you think is going on about surgery. Um, and oftentimes it kind of takes a few clinic sessions before you can before you sign them up for surgery because mm -hmm. they basically need to exhaust a lot of conservative management options before you recommend surgery to them. Um, and then, you know, if they're still experiencing uh, pain or, for example, some neurologic deficit, then you kind of talk more about surgery. Uh, and then you get to see them postoperatively like weeks mm -hmm. out. Um, so that's, that's okay. always a good thing to see because... In the hospital, you, you oftentimes just, you know, take care of them for that perioperative period. And then you don't see them for months on end or, you know, unfortunately, if they have a complication or something, you'll, they'll come back. But um, it's good to kind of have that. Longitudinal care. Of exactly. Yeah, nice. um, and you get to have that as, a, as an attending. But sometimes when you're a resident, you it's hard for you to see the big picture of yeah. what you're doing. So... So regular days in the hospital, OR days would be kind of 12 hours, 5 to 6 or 7. Mm -hmm. uh, and then clinic days, is that like Shorter. 8 to 4, 8 to 5 yeah. kind of thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you don't start doing clinic days until 4th, 5th year, 3rd year? Um, it depends. Uh, I did more clinic personally in my 4th and 5th year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, And now there are more efforts kind of put in to have residents be involved in clinic mm -hmm. earlier because it's still an important part yeah. of, you know, being able to select patients for for surgery and kind of figure out who might benefit the most from, mm -hmm. you know, the surgeries yeah. that you yeah. can offer. Um, so that's that's really important for spine. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's, it's an important part of fellowship training and specialty training. Um, and it's something that like we're actively trying to incorporate early. It's interesting. Cause when I was, I mean, before I even started to med school, I didn't think surgeons ever went to the clinic. You know what I mean? Oh. I thought they just lived in the OR. I thought that's what their <laughs> entire job, the surgeons, they just stay, they cut things and then they go home. They cut no. things and then they go home. I had no idea. That's that such an important part of, I, I think know. it's not everybody's favorite part yeah. of the specialty. Mm -hmm. um, definitely neurosurgical procedure. That's kind Big of deal. one of the biggest days of their lives. Yeah. So you kind of have to do a lot of counseling and talk to them about what they'll experience and, you know, what what to uh, what to expect. And that, that becomes a big part of that. I was talking to uh, Dr. Okasanya, I don't know if you know, a CT surgeon at Jefferson. And he was saying he actually thinks the clinic days are the most important days at event, at event, more important than the OR even because he's like, these are where the decisions are made. Oh, this for is sure. where he's worried he might miss something or make a bad decision because when you're in the OR, you know, you're just, you're, of course, there are different paths that procedures can go down, but yeah. you're essentially doing a set 
set of things to do, right? Yeah. Uh, but in the clinic is where you're making these actual decisions oh, for to sure. go through with this. So It's harder to tell a patient uh, to not operate on a patient sometimes than operate on them. And you kind of have to have a clear idea of what aspect of the disease they have that you can help with and what what things you're not expected expecting to get better with surgery. You can be in the greatest hands of some somebody very experienced and take, you know, every precaution, give perioperative antibiotics or uh, you know, make sure every sterility is perfect and all of that. But patients still can get infections and have complications that are just oftentimes just unfortunately bad luck. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, you kind of have to weigh those risks against uh, the kind of benefits that you can provide and, and be realistic. Yeah, it's where it's almost where I think medicine surgery becomes an art because you're taking these standardized risk calculations, right, mm -hmm. which you're performing on every patient and saying, okay, their risk is, say, 10% on this procedure, uh, but then also maybe this could happen if they don't go through the procedure, and it's where yeah. your kind of experience and your clinical training comes in to say, listen, we're... Because they always ask the question, this is my ex brief experience with patients. They normally say, what would you do? What do you think I should do? Oh, it's very yeah. rarely, I mean, sometimes it is, but rarely in my experience they're saying, listen, I've done the, I've done the statistical analysis myself. I know how I feel. I know yeah. what the results of the procedure are going to be. I want to do this. Usually yeah. they're turning to you. Yeah. Usually they're turning to you and saying, listen, make the decision for me. I trust you as an expert, my advocate and my caretaker to kind of make this decision. And it's... A, it's a tough decision. Oh, yeah. It's a tough decision. Yeah, it's true. So on more decisions, if I were to give you $100 million and I were to say, okay, you have this $100 million, no taxes, it's yours, it's in your bank account, do whatever you want. Would you, A, continue to train and become a full-time attending neurosurgeon and stay a full-time attending neurosurgeon? B, work part-time. C, quit entirely and go live on a beach or something like that. Or oh D, God. switch careers. Personally, I... I would continue working for sure. Full time? Uh, I think so. Uh, it would be hard to do neurosurgery part time okay. too. I think at this point, I'm excited to be able to take care of patients with, you know, with neurosurgical issues and mm -hmm. and uh, kind of practice. So. I want to say that I would continue working. Hey. Uh, I would like to, yeah, I would like to... Continue to work full-time. Exactly. And I think it makes a little bit more sense maybe for you as opposed, the answer makes more sense in my head to you as opposed to maybe someone who's later down in their career because, you know, this is new to you and you're new, you're going to be a new attending. You want to get through all the training and stuff like that and the learning. And the other good point, which is the other ethical point that I sometimes think about when I an am answering this question for myself, is if I had a doctor... Would I want a doctor that dedicates their whole life to it, spends every second doing research, spends every second doing practicing their clinical skills, their technique, everything like that? Or would I want someone that works part-time on this? Yeah. I don't know. I think I I'd want the, the guy who's crazy mad about <laughs> neurosurgery, guy or girl crazy mad yeah. about neurosurgery and spends every waking second of their life thinking about it, right? So, I don't know. It's, I, that, that may be a little more yeah, extreme. Of course. Of, we're doing yeah, probably yeah. on purpose. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, also yeah. it brings up the point, you know, uh, people talk about reimbursement and uh -huh. how much money uh, the average neurosurgeon makes. And although it's like the stats you had talked about earlier, although it's more than uh, the average Double. physician, yeah. exactly, uh, you spend so much time in residency where you're not getting paid very mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. fellowship. Um, so you're technically, I think for the hours you work, if you make the calculation, you're mm -hmm. technically working like below minimum yeah, wage. I, I, I believe it. I haven't made the calculation, but I'm sure and for then, interns, you're, you're making below minimum wage. And then, wage. you know, me going through medical school, going, you know, doing research before that, maybe even, uh, you know, all that adds up. And that's in addition to, of course, completing college mm -hmm. here. So, Oh, I don't think it's an unfair compensation uh, at all. I just think it's it's, a, it's interesting, right? Because it's crazy. It's it's a crazy amount of time. And I think... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've never heard of somebody going into neurosurgery who pr purely said, you know, oh, I'm doing it because, like, the compensation is so good at the I, end of the... the that, they shouldn't do it. Then. Exactly. Because yeah, it's it so much... Um, you... You have to make a lot of sacrifices, and 
Uh, I you, think that's true for nearly all. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. I think so. And then you have to enjoy also taking care of very s- sick patients mm-hmm. sometimes even. Uh, and uh, being in tough, you know, life life or death situations, making those decisions too. So that all goes into it. And there's no amount of money if you didn't have the heart to be in it that could possibly compensate you enough yeah. if you're not genuinely wanting to do it, I Definitely. would say. Definitely good point. Why neurosurgery then? For me, it was a combination of a lot of things. You have to have a, a love for neuro-na- neuroanatomy. And actually in college, I did not plan to, to double major initially. I did public health and uh, I was really interested in population health, uh, which can be kind of thought to be almost at odds with neurosurgery because it's such a small population of people who gets affected by certain neurologic diseases. Mm-hmm. Uh, that require neurosurgery, but um, I did public health initially, and then I started taking neuroscience classes, and they were like the weed out classes that I ended up enjoying so much for some reason. I was taking them as an elective, and I ended up like weed accidentally out neuroscience classes? like like, uh, like classes where anatomy they wanted the brain or yeah something? they yeah. wanted to make sure that people were you know dedicated to that major and. Those were the hard, known as the hard classes. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I just like... Just killed them anyway. No, but I <laughs> I ended up kind of stumbling into those classes. I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. And then basically almost accidentally double double majoring in neuroscience. You just I enjoyed, kept, did you just keep signing up for courses? Yeah. And like, well, you might as well get them Yeah, exactly. Then, then at a certain point, somebody told me, oh, yeah, it's possible for you to double major. So... I um so I genuinely enjoyed that that aspect. Um I think we touched upon a, a few things, uh, but basically it's uh a very rewarding uh specialty where you get to interact and, and be part of patients' lives and um so you know, during some of their most impactful experiences. Uh, and you get to interact with a lot of other subspecialties um, where oftentimes intertwined with, you know, neuro- neurology, radiology, ENT, different specialties where we're kind of having an ongoing discussion of a patient. And that part is, um, I think, you know, very nice to, to be able to kind of have that interaction. Uh, you have to have a strong grasp of medicine still because, uh Neurointensive care is very important in the care of neurosurgery patients. So you have to be able to, um, <clears throat> you know, manage ICU issues uh, throughout different systems in the body, not not only the, you know, uh, neurologic issues. Um, you also uh, get to kind of, have your life be put into perspective when you treat patients with neurosurgical issues because you realize, you know, patients are resilient and you learn a lot from that, from from them from about that. But at the same time, like you realize your life can change in the split mm-hmm. in a split second. And to care for somebody, for example, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, a stroke, spinal cord injury, somebody who's been diagnosed with cancer, you know. <laughs> It just kind of makes you appreciate a lot of little things in your life mm-hmm. and, and your health, your abilities that um, I think kind of uh, just add to to your life. your life in a very impactful way. So in college, did, so did you know neurosurgery in college? Where you did the neuroscience and then like at the end you're like, oh. I know for sure I'm going medicine. Oh, no. And no, you just thought medicine? <sighs> I thought medicine in college. Yeah. Um, I did do, I signed up through that, uh, through that uh, major. I signed up for a, like, observership, actually, mm. with... Like shadowing at Hopkins? Uh, shadowing a neurosurgeon at Hopkins, uh, Dr. Biden, actually. He was a spine surgeon there. Wow. And he was so kind and, like, uh, went through 
uh, MRIs with me, went through imaging. Uh, wow, I haven't talked about this in a while. <laughs> but he, um, like, it gave me a different idea of what neurosurgery could be like. I think it's nice to kind of meet charismatic people or people who are, who you can relate to. Like, he, people think of neurosurgery, neurosurgeons as, like, uh, mad scientists almost uh -huh. sometimes the, who have sometimes. like very little social skills sometimes yeah. or they're just like singularly focused on their job and um, it's nice to meet just real people who have other hobbies and other so Dr. You know. Biden was a real person <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly now he was very kind and I think it was uh, very nice and and I learned I learned a lot from him initially and then um and it was like a short rotation. I'm sure he doesn't remember me, but uh, then I went on and kind of saw different experiences. I, after college, I volunteered at Weill Cornell in their um, neurosurgical ward. This was also very random. <laughs> I just mm -hmm. uh, ended up spending a few hours uh, every week kind of taking care of patients, talking to their families, hearing a lot about their stories. Is this a gap year? Uh, this was a gap year, got yes. Okay, and I did it. something else. Like, I worked at a pediatrics office, actually. But most of the time and did other things. Um, but uh, I ended up doing that. And I was very inspired by the patients and kind of learning about what they had gone through, what their recovery looked like. And little by little, I kind of... Um, saw different experiences and uh, I think going into medical school initially uh, I don't I don't know if I knew that I would ultimately pursue neurosurgery I had other people telling me you know you kind of have to rule everything else out uh, and if you're still interested in neurosurgery at the end of the day uh, you know that's what you should do but it's such a grueling specialty that uh, you know, you have to be prepared to like not talk to your family for a long time, and that's what and I, I hear that too. That, that's I hear that too, I hear too, or yeah. like people tell you, you know, I knew I wanted to do neurosurgery, and I and I knew a neurosurgeon, and they told me they you know couldn't spend time with their kids, or and I think there are certain sacrifices you make, but at the same time, like if there are things that are important to you, you can still make it work. And I come from a very tight-knit family, too. So uh, I think <clears throat> uh, I heard these stories, and they kind of scared me. But at the same time, you know, I have a very supportive family, and uh, they they really kind of supported me and, and pushed me to still still do it because at the end of the day, you know, I still— It's what you wanted to do. It's what I wanted to do, and— uh, they knew I could make it work. And when I didn't have, you know, full faith in myself, they kind of pushed me at the same time. Not to say that uh, my mom is, is the only person in my family who's in healthcare. She's mm -hmm. a nurse. And I learned a lot from her, but my parents never expected any of us, you know, my siblings and I, to go into medicine at all. Um, and, but, you know... It's, it's important to have somebody on your side mm -hmm. when you have doubts to kind of uh, support you along. And I'm yeah. really thankful for that. Yeah. Do you think, because um, I'm sure you've experienced challenges and hardship, you know, going through not only medical school, but neurosurgery, would you say the biggest helpers for you, the people that kept you in it, the people that kept you motivated and focused and not burning out or not getting depressed or sad or yeah. frustrated, were you, was, was your family? Did you use, was there anything else that helped you stay, quote unquote, well? Yeah, I I mean, I think my family. Uh, I I got married at the end of uh, medical school, actually, mm -hmm. right before starting residency. And my husband too. He's um, he keeps me sane. He's a family mm -hmm. medicine attending, actually. Wow. Uh, he just finished his residency last year, and he's a hospitalist, a Farber hospitalist at okay. um, in our department in neurosurgery, actually. So we get wow. to kind of work together and I get to call him and That's say, awesome. you know, what do you think about this? Does and we get to col you? collaborate. Oh yeah. He calls yeah. me about things all the time. And I run things by him yeah. too, because there are certain things, um, like more medicine things that I may not be as fresh on. 
that aren't like critical care related mm-hmm. or just like, oh, what do you do for, I don't Pneumonia. know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or little things that I'll ask him about. Um, or how do you follow this, you know? Uh, and he, yeah, it's it's been cool to kind of so fa- ideas. So family, relationships, those are, you think were the yeah. major support structures and it's, for you. And it's funny because when I was applying into neurosurgery, I was engaged at the time. And uh, I'm not sure, you know, I kind of had different different things said to me about being a woman going into neurosurgery who is in a long-term relationship. Um, Did they say, what do they say? It wouldn't work out? It's no, or, no. or, and it's not from people I was interviewing with. It's yeah. just from like other medical students or other people uh, who uh, I was talking to before. And, you know, I think it was thought, and I don't know if this is true, mm-hmm. but for a man going into a specialty like neurosurgery, it kind of... Um, if they're married, it kind of shows that they're like in a stable relationship. They have a lot of support that may not be the same for a woman or I, like there were other things that I was told that made me kind of, I decided not to wear my engagement ring for interviews at all. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I kind of didn't. What are they worried about? They're worried you're not going to be as focused on neurosurgery because you're in a relationship? Yeah. Or that you might get pregnant or something I don't know, exactly. Like but uh, those are kind of like illegal questions. People, yeah, they can't. You know, ask you they those can't things. ask you yeah, those yeah. things. Or, uh, but I didn't even want it to come into the, the kind of. I didn't think anybody needed to know about my relationship yeah, no, or don't. whether yeah. whether that'll impact my experience positively or negatively. So, well, and did then, you did you see that in practice when you were kind of at when you were on the interview trail and that like that? Did people ask you about relationships? Or no, no nobody. Okay. Nobody. This was ever just asked. other med students and other yeah, people scaring and you and a I'm little like, bit. Okay, uh, that's I, that's good to hear. That's yeah, nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. So you so you did college. You did this neuroscience thing. And you're like, this is kind of cool. And then you did your experience. And you're like, this is pretty cool. I'm going to do medicine. So you go to medicine. You're in med school. At what point is the neurosurgery decision made? I think I kind of had a good idea that I wanted to get into it, like, at the time, around my second year. Yeah. Uh, I had done some research in neurosurgery between first and second year. Mm-hmm. Then after that summer, you really just keep going, mm-hmm. I think. You're like, you don't There's have no as much. Summers. Exactly. And then you're a fourth year, you have a little bit of more time. But Yeah, exactly. But before that, you're, like, just in med school nonstop. I put so much importance on step one. I remember, and I was, uh, I fortunately ended up doing well, but I was so stressed about, okay, is it is it going to be prohibitive for me to, you know, entering neurosurgery? Like, is it a death sentence mm-hmm. for, you know, being able mm-hmm. to get in? I would say I I did well, and I, I was, a, you know, I was able to get interviews and everything. A little less stress when I, when I got my score, and then I was able to, do my clinical rotations and I loved my neurosurgical rotation. I think I did a short rotation during my neurology clerkship and then got to do some neurosurgery and then ended up doing, yeah, fourth year, you really have to do sub eyes and AIs and all of that. So um, you get like three, four to four months of neurosurgery. Um, So it's, uh, I guess I knew pretty early on, and that was an advantage that mm-hmm. you know I was able to do some research early on. Um, but I've had friends who kind of decided late and were still successful in in getting in and making it happen. Great, are you have and you're happy with the decision of neurosurgery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good. I couldn't imagine doing anything yeah. else to be honest. Was there anything close? Or it was definitely. Not I think great. for a split second, I thought about ENT. I did my rotation uh-huh. in ENT, and. Um, it was interesting, but honestly, the cases that were the most exciting to me were cases that we were doing Close with neurosurgery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, okay, Just there's a reason for that. Yeah. I should, you know, and I, I love it. Yeah. I'm so glad I did it. So your husband's a family medicine attending and you're a neuros- neurosurgery, neurosurgery mm-hmm. seventh year. Do you notice differences in lifestyle, work life, those kind of things? Because, you know, we hear things about family medicine and then we hear things about neurosurgery. 
Are those things true? Does he have a oh chill, relaxing life and you have no relaxing life? Or is it kind of no, less less true than me? I think, I think that's less true. Yeah. Uh, we definitely... Uh, he isn't attending as he's well. He's not so, attending, yeah. but I think going through uh, residency, it's funny to hear about uh, just... They're kind of more of like an empathic, huggy residency yeah. group yeah. and i'm not saying that we're not empathic each other? No. but they're like very warm and fuzzy and we're we're different at the same time um but you i don't think you see those differences as much outside of of work um yeah uh but he still gets gets a taste of what neurosurgery is yeah. because he takes care of Neurosurgical mm-hmm, patients as mm-hmm. well now, so mm-hmm. you send them all the neurosurgery. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. He has to take them. He has to, <laughs> no, right? Exactly. That's funny. So, what is the best thing about being a neurosurgeon? The best thing, um, I think, getting to uh, operate on incredible structures. And uh, on patients, and and be able to be a part of hopefully their journey to recovery, and um, it's just the kind of it's incredibly rewarding. I would say that's the biggest thing that that I love about it. That's great. And now you know the next question: What is the worst thing about being a neurosurgeon? That's a hard question. You could say there's nothing bad I, about it. It's all good. I guess, I mean, I guess the hours that you you have to spend, um, sometimes you feel like you end up missing out on certain parts of of, uh, being with loved ones. But uh, at the same time, I think you you kind of have to be more diligent about scheduling things and figuring out what things are important to you and what you— don't want to miss out on. What's the longest procedure you've been in? That's that's a hard question. I think in medical school, I've been in cer- certain skull-based cases that went into the night, and they were like first first case, so, so starting at seven thirty, um, and going to like seven o'clock or five o'clock. Oh, like what do you mean, five p.m.? Five p.m. Oh yeah. no, no no like like past midnight sometimes. So, uh, uh, so seven a.m. To midnight, and I mean, I've had I've had some procedures that take take a long time. Seven now. that's seventeen hours in an it's, operating room. Yeah, it's a long time. I've I've heard of people, you know, being in doing surgery even longer, you but take, you that's very breaks, unusual. Right? You take breaks to, to go to yeah, the yeah, especially surgeries that are that long usually have uh, kind of combined teams okay. working. So sometimes, like an ENT surgeon will be involved or other teams. Um, yeah, there there are surgeries where you, usually it's uh, skull base, I would mm-hmm. say, um, where you have multiple teams involved and they can take a long time. But that's, yeah. I would say that's an anomaly even for skull base. Especially in neurosurgery residency. How do you maintain your like wellness and positive attitude and feeling, you know, not burnt out because you're not do you, yeah. you are you burnt out or not i no, don't think so yeah i don't think so so how do you how do you maintain your wellness i just have other things outside of neurosurgery that like i think it's still important to kind of have an identity outside of your specialty mm-hmm. as much as you can love it i think uh sometimes you need breaks from it to be honest uh recently i got into something that i was doing in college actually uh I started doing a lot of indoor rock climbing. Indoor rock climbing. Yeah. I was just talking to one of my friends. What level walls do you do? I was just talking to one of my so friends. So I'm about. doing more bouldering. Okay. Right now I'm like V3, V4 V3, bouldering. V3, V4. That's pretty good. Uh, but I'm I'm still, you know, trying to improve and just focusing on being like as healthy as possible. Hopefully not, you know not injuring myself. I think a lot of the time people injure themselves from like pulling muscles and doing things that uh, maybe they're not, their body's not ready to do. So I'm just like taking it slow and 
That's uh, good. Enjoying, enjoying it. I'm a med student and I'm interested in going into neurosurgery. What should I do maybe in my medical school career or maybe even undergrad to make myself the most competitive, the best chances of getting into a neurosurgery program? Okay. Uh, you should still keep an open mind towards other specialties. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if in the back of your mind you want to do neurosurgery and learn more about it, be more exposed to it, that's great. You should definitely seek opportunities. Um, I've seen people as young as, you know, high school students be involved in research labs, neurosurgical research, research labs. Um, oftentimes, you have like college students and medical student level researchers, but um, if you're motivated, I think you can kind of find your own opportunities, email people. Uh, don't get discouraged if a neurosurgeon doesn't reply to you just because I think they get like hundreds of emails a day. I'm sure they get a lot of emails, but um, at the same time, you know, uh, try to find kind of research opportunities. Um, I did, I mentioned like a, an observership uh, type of experience that was being offered at my school. Um, I applied to be like basically a, a nursing aide uh, for just an additional experience, uh, a, a volunteer experience at Wild Cornell. Um, then I think research really helps. And even if you don't end up ultimately doing neurosurgery, uh, it can help for any field in, you know, in medicine. So uh, that's always something good to have under your belt. Um, and then kind of, I think when you're applying, you know, some, some people kind of talk about, oh, I've always known to be, you know, I've always known that I wanted to do neurosurgery. Little boy, yeah. And it's like, uh, I mean, I think that's that's fine. But at the same time, like you don't always have to know that you've wanted to do it your entire life and that your entire life culminated towards you, you know, doing this, that uh, it's possible, you know, to, to kind of... Um, kind of figure out later on that you want to do it. Oftentimes when you're interacting with a neurosurgical team or doing a sub-I, you know, we really just want to get to know you, get to know your personality and see that you're a good fit for our group. Um, so that becomes like really the important, most important part at the end of the day because you can have a lot of qualifications, but you also, you know, want to have that personal connection. That makes sense. What do you think are the characteristics of someone that would excel in neurosurgery? So I think you have to be resilient, uh, kind of be able to take feedback. Yeah. Do you have any tricks or tips for, say, someone's going into neurosurgery and they're starting, they've, this is a couple months away, we're in interview season right now for, uh, interview season I guess is just starting for residency, but do you have any tips and tricks for kind of incoming neurosurgery residents? Like, I know some people, surgeons, they keep a notebook where they keep all their procedures and attending preferences and stuff like that. Are there certain tips and tricks that you've learned through neurosurgery, things that you've seen successful interns and junior residents do? Mm, tips and tricks. I think uh, just keep an open mind, be willing to learn, uh, be willing to uh, ask questions. Uh, and that's a lot of, you know, a lot of the time how, how you learn. And uh, I think a lot of the time how you avoid complications too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just having a clear understanding of the protocols and, you know, the pathway to uh, caring for a certain type of patient is important and you can get that guidance from, from senior residents. Um, uh, be humble. Uh, you know, I think even when you're a junior resident, you're put in kind of a leadership position when you're, for example, going down to the trauma bay and you're the only neurosurgery representative maybe with another like second year resident. Um, and, uh, it becomes very important to be able to know, uh, you know, uh, know how you can help the team and be a team player. Uh, but at the same time, you're like now put in a position where you're the neurosurgery doctor and you, cool. you have to yeah. 
kind of assess its situation. And you, yes, you talk to other um, more senior residents who also come assess the patient. You, tell, you um, discuss the case with attendings and everything, but uh, you're kind of like thrown into this position. And I remember starting off, you know, you hear like Dr. Hattar and you turn around, you're like, they're talking to me. Like you're just starting and somehow, somehow uh, you're put in this position. But I think those are the main things, just keeping an open mind, staying humble, being a team player uh, and just working hard because yeah. at the end of the day, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other and working diligently, you'll get where you need to be. Sometimes you get, you have growing pain starting mm -hmm. off, but that's normal. Everybody experiences that. That's helpful. And then for the future of neurosurgery, is there anything exciting? What is, is there anything that's exciting to you about the future of neurosurgery? Are we going to be able to, you know, transplant heads at any time soon or brains or, or you don't think so? I don't, I don't think so. I don't no. think so. Darn it. <laughs> um, the future of neurosurgery. Uh, I think something exciting for me in surgery in general and neurosurgery too is uh, just seeing more uh, kind of the visibility of women in the field. Because I, I think starting off, and that's the experience I've heard a lot of other female surgeons have that, um, and now it's a little better, but sometimes you kind of just have to have a blind faith that, things will work out, but you don't see like yourself represented in mm -hmm. certain specialties. And women, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that great of representation in, in neurosurgery. About, I think, 12% of neurosurgeons are women. Mm. Um, so it's uh, one of the fields where not as many women are entering the field. That could be for many reasons. Um, but I think kind of that is changing to some degree. Um, and it's nice to have some representation, some role models, uh, like Dr. Chumakera, she was one mm -hmm. of the, uh, uh, she was the first like female dual trained endovascular, open wow. vascular neurosurgeon in the U S. Yeah, her, uh, her resume is pretty yeah, insane. It's re really incredible. Uh, Shelly Timmons was one of the double ANS first, pre uh, one of the presidents, uh, past presidents a few years ago. There's... Uh, women in neurosurgery group, which is, which is a national group, um, kind of promoting women in the field as well. Uh, so it's, and I think a few years back, there was like that campaign of uh, this, I am a surgeon or this, I'm probably butchering this, but I don't, I don't know. Um, like this is what a surgeon looks like. And mm -hmm. it was women posting on social media that they were surgeons. So it's kind of, uh, it's nice for people to, to see that, uh, you know, there's diversity mm -hmm. uh, in, in neurosurgery as well. And I hope that more people get to um, kind of be exposed to that and realize like, oh, wow, people are able to and do And you this. are helping with that right now. I hope now. so, you yeah. You are, you are. Um, so I think we're nearing the end here. Do you have any closing remarks for pe medical students who are interested in neurosurgery? Say they're a first or second year, and you know they they're kind of like they're kind of like I think this is cool, but you know everyone in school is telling me neurosurgery is hard, uh -huh. or anything like that, or any closing remarks that you want to say whatsoever. I would say if you love it uh, and you really want to do neurosurgery, there are ways to to um, pursue it. Uh, there's you know, I know people who might have not not had the highest grades or might have not had the largest amount of research or there are always ways around that. And um, you can always, uh, if you're truly dedicated, you may need to take, you know, a few years off and uh, maybe polish up your, your resume a little bit, but it's, it's feasible to do. In terms of um, kind of sacrifices. I think it's an incredibly rewarding career choice. Uh, it may be a lot of hours that you spend training, but uh, it's worth it. And I wouldn't say um, you you have a lot of support with other people going through it at the same time. Uh, I think a lot of people could do it. I wouldn't be just discouraged based on what other people say about, you know, uh, work-life balance and things like that. Um, 
And uh, that's basically it. Perfect. And final question. What is your favorite song to listen to in the OR? Do you have a favorite song? Or favorite artist? Favorite artist. I know uh, some say Dua Lipa or who else? Or famous <laughs> Jefferson people like. We do listen to Dua Lipa. Yeah, though, mm-hmm. or, like, I've contemporary heard Dua Lipa music. a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I've been into Amy Winehouse Amy recently. Amy Winehouse. Uh, I think it's... it's uh, She's just uh, so talented, and uh, I've. Do you sing during procedures as well? Or no, no, not no. really. No, that's, maybe but maybe that's good. but uh, I I would say I've recently I've listened to a few of her songs again after many years of not uh-huh. listening to them, and that's perfect. That's perfect. Is, uh, the cadence is good. It's not too mm-hmm. too fast. It's pretty catchy. Yeah, she's an incredible vocalist. Amazing. Well, Amy Winehouse, that's the answer <laughs> to the entire podcast. Thank you so much, Lena, for appearing. It was fantastic and really helpful. All right. Thank you. Thank you.